Good morning, everybody. This is Alison Coleman. Welcome to Schools Forum today on the 22nd of June. I'll just run through the meeting etiquette just to remind everybody if you could leave your cameras off and your microphones on mute unless you're called to speak. If you would like to make a comment or raise a question at any point during the meeting, please could you indicate that via the chat function. And when I ask you uh, to come forward to speak, if you could then turn on your video camera and your microphone and just say your name before you make your comment or ask your question. Uh, just remind everybody that this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube as it is a public meeting. So I'll just run through the apologies we've received. We have had apologies from Daniel Jones, Pat Chapman, Dawn Carmen Jones, Darren Woodward, we have a substitute. We have uh, Peter Collins is attending on behalf of Sue Prickett. Uh, we, since the last meeting, Angela Berry has moved on from the Suffolk Academies Trust, so isn't in attendance today as she has left Suffolk. And uh, we'll be saying goodbye today to Louise Spall, who is leaving Summer Layton Primary at the end of the summer term. And so will also be resigning her position as an Academy representative and as ever, if uh, the Academy representatives would like uh, Adrian or the local authority to uh, run the election process on your behalf, then um, that function is available to you. I'll just run through the list of people who we have in attendance this morning. So we have Amanda Havers, Adrian Orr, Alison Bowman, Alan Cadzo, Andrew Berry, Angela Ransby, Barbara Barraclough, who's attending to support us when we have the uh, voting later on. Christina Lewis, Colin Shaw, Darren Jackson, Gemma Morgan, Jill Mitchell, Julia Upton. Oh, I've now got, I'm having a mental block. Karen Mills, sorry, Karen, I've forgotten your surname for a minute. You came up as Karen and I've missed your surname. Louise Spall, Michael Quinton, Maria Kemble, Peter Collins, Rachel Hood, that's Councillor Rachel Hood, who is our, our new uh, County Council Cabinet Lead, so welcome to your first meeting, Councillor Hood, Ruth Coleman, Sharon Waldron, Sonia Harbin, my list has jumped, just a moment. You know when you try to use a scroll bar and it doesn't want to scroll, it's doing that to me. Apologies. Steve Lovett and Teresa Spilling, who is taking the minute. So they're the people who are present in the meeting currently. So welcome to you all to this meeting today. So I've run through the apologies and the meeting etiquette. So we can now move on to paper A, which is the minutes of the last meeting. You should all have a copy of that in front of you. So I'd like to run through that for matters arising and actions page by page, please. So if you have uh, anything you wish to raise, if you could pop that in the message box as I go through and then I'll jump across and ask you to raise your point. So anything from page one, page two, page three, I'm conscious I might need to jump back if, they'll, if there's a delay in you typing, but that's no problem. Page four and five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We do have an action on page 11. Adrian, could I ask you if there's any update on whether you'd had a conversation with Christina Lewis about the need to have a conversation about early years challenges and sufficiency, please? Good morning, everybody. Yeah, good morning, Alison. Thank you. I'll come back on that. Yeah, we did have a conversation. We involved um, Alan in the conversation as well. Um, I mean, I think at this stage, our view was that we needed to get get an idea from the sector um, about um, an additional working group. And I think with some of the things going on, that's not been that straightforward. But I think I'm right in saying, Christina, you're raising it with the sector this term. 
just check with, in with Christina, who I think is on the call. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. I am yeah. at our, yeah. our forum meeting this term. Yeah. So, so hopefully that covers that, Alison. Thanks. Okay, Christina. that's super. Yeah, thanks both of you for your update. Um, thank you, Alan. I can see that um, you have requested just a word change on page 10. And under the comment for Alan, Teresa, if you could change that to deal rather than detail. Thank you very much. So we're now on to page 12 and 13. 14. I'm coming back to you again, Adrian. Uh, on page 14, uh, there was a request for members of the forum to raise any budget concerns with you. I don't know if you had any feedback from members. I did. I had um, I had some very helpful feedback um, uh, and a thanks to forum members who sent me um, information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just just the background to this was that we were asked and, and colleagues from the January meeting will remember we had a bit of a discussion about lobbying and um, Mary Evans, our former cabinet member, who was a member of the F40 group executive, um, had had got a request to collect some real uh, real life cases of the impact um, of COVID, but also funding in general. And I know some colleagues on the in this meeting will also be members of the F40 group. So we'll have seen that on the me meeting of the um, uh, 8th of March, Mary raised um, particularly the issues around SEND funding and the contributions that people gave to me at the meeting that were in the minutes and also the contributions that people sent in to me. And I'm grateful for colleagues who weren't even who weren't able to attend the January meeting but had read the minutes and sent some stuff in to me. That formed part of the submission that the F40 group put to MPs and to the Department for Education. Um, colleagues will know that we've got an ongoing um, uh, engagement with the F40 group uh, and how they can lobby for the lowest funded 40 local authorities in the country. So um, that was really helpful to have that information. And I'm very conscious that very busy head teachers, very busy CEOs uh, made those contributions um, and we put them, Mary took them forward on our behalf. That's great. Thank you. That was a good outcome from the last meeting. We can only hope that the DFE will finally listen to us after all this time, but um, we will we will await that and see what happens next. Uh, also on page 14, there was an action uh, around the DSG recovery plan. And as you know, we've got that on today's agenda. And then page 15 was just about the date of the next meeting, which had been due to be in April. And that one was postponed because there wasn't any uh, business that we needed to cover at that meeting after all. And so we've now got today's meeting in June. So I'll, I will assume that everybody is happy to accept these minutes as accurate unless anybody puts any other comments in the comment box to me. And I'll now move on to paper B. And Adrian, we're turning back to you. Thank you. This paper is about the terms of office for long term members. Thank you. Th thanks, Alison. Just at that point, my, my chair decided to collapse down. So sort of bear with me bobbing about as I get my uh, get my chair to uh, to, to, to behave itself. Right. Um, so um, uh, firstly, um, hopefully colleagues will, ha ha will have had a chance to read the brief paper that I put together. It's an information item. I need to start the item with a huge thanks to um, the colleagues who joined the task and finish group, um, some of whom are here, some of whom who have now moved on because as your, your reference to Angela Berry, um, having moved on to her new role um, outside of Suffolk, but I'm very grateful to that group. We've got some um, some, some issues to, to look at. Um, and just as a quick refresher, colleagues will remember that at the January meeting, we voted on a four-year term of office for school forum members. Um, the term of office arrangements sit with the local authority, and we could just decide them. But as, as forum members will know that that's not the way we like to operate things we like to do things in a collaborative and collegiate way and we put some proposals to the um, January meeting that um, were adopted but it left us with a couple of um, a couple of issues that we needed to address and the task and finish group very much did that the first was that we'd got 
um, six members of Forum who were long-term members of Forum and joined Forum before we'd got formal voting arrangements in place. And we needed to come up with a fair and transparent way to 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 address that issue. And, and we had a really, um, really helpful um, and meaningful debate and came to the view that those Forum members' term of office would run until December 2021 when they would be able to stand again. And that would mean that we were aligning, um, you know, a proper election process for forum members. So, so that was the first um, positive outcome that we uh, that we got from the meeting. I think the second one that we had quite a debate about was the representation on forum. And I think we came to a view that forum very much represents um, the shape of leadership and governance across the whole Suffolk sector. And I think it's incumbent upon us all to work in our individual settings as well as collectively to see, um, you know, as far as we can, that we have a forum that represents um, the people of Suffolk. But also we need the expertise that that governors, that trust board members, that CEOs and that head teachers um bring and that led us on to something that um was an outcome that we you know we hadn't originally intended but i think was a very positive outcome from the meeting which is that we need to refresh and review the induction program for new forum members as we've already mentioned there will be some folk leaving forum um this year we'll be inducting some we'll be um running um uh, maintained elections around that. Our offer, as Alison said, stands to the academy sector. If you would like us to run um, as a third party your elections, as we've done in the past, we're very, very happy to do that. But we'd quite like to put um, a more detailed induction process in place for new forum members. And part of that is another ask. And you know, I come to these meetings with asks of forum members. Um, one of those asks is for some volunteers from forum you know members who've been part of forum for a little while who could act as mentors in the first year um, for new forum members there's quite a lot for people to get their head around and there was a sense from colleagues in the working group that that's something they would have welcomed when they joined um when they joined forum so um I'll sort of finish on that ask, if I may. People could email me. Um, I'm really keen to um, develop uh, the induction program. I'm going to be contacting people individually that were part of that task and finish group, um, but also put a request out more widely to forum to contribute to the um, to the induction program. But also any forum member that would be prepared to give up a little bit of time to act as a mentor um, in the first year of um, new forum members. Um, uh, membership of this group. Um, we've got some tough decisions to make in the years ahead. We've already touched on some of the challenges around finance um, in the in, in looking at the minutes and the work of the F40 group. Um, so supporting forum members to get up to speed very, very quickly, I think, um, is a positive uh, positive um, thing to do. Um, I'm going to stop there, but I am going to invite any members of, that were part of the Task and Finish group, if there's anything they want to add or anything they think I've missed or didn't cover appropriately. Is there anybody else from the task group who'd like to speak this morning? I'd just like to echo what Adrian has said. I think that was a very productive meeting. Uh, I can see Andrew is clapping his hands, so I think Andrew's in agreement with... Um, with what you've just said, Adrian, and, and with the content of the paper. Uh, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot this morning, uh, but if any of you who have been on, on the forum for a while, you'll all know what we're like with our marvellous terminology. And uh, for, for any people who are new today, apologies, because we do like our jargon here and we do get very tied up in some of it sometimes and so used to it, that just have, having somebody to just help once you've read the papers for the first time that you can pick the phone up or send an email to somebody and say what's what's going on behind this or what what's the real meaning of this or what's the implications of this just to have somebody as a sounding board I, I think would be very helpful for for new members I know there's a bit of that been going on informally already but um, it would be really good uh, Sharon has just put a comment in is there a reference document explaining the induction process that the panel feel you'd like to be covered and Andrew has said there was also a focus on encouragement of governance members for putting themselves forward to schools forum. 
Yeah, if I just come back on a couple of those, if I may, Alison, um, uh, the, the, in, in terms of Sharon's comments, um, there's some very out of date documentation, Sharon. And I think one of um, actually one of the summer holiday tasks that I've set myself and a colleague is to redraft that with a view to testing it with um, some, you know, the task and finish group um, so that we've got something that's a little bit more and a, a little bit more up to date and a little bit more robust. Um, and actually, Andrew's made a really important point there. One of the things that we we discussed that actually I hadn't covered um, in my overview is the real importance of retaining a balance on forum of school leaders, trust leaders, but also governors and trust um, uh, trust board members. I think a real strength of Suffolk Schools Forum over a good number of years has been that balance in leadership and governance. And I think we felt that there was a risk that that could shift. And in the election process, and also the processes prior to an election, we thought we would go out more widely to governors and trust board members to see if we can try and ensure that we retain that valuable balance. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the thanks for reminding me of that. Thanks, Adrian. Um, Ali, thank you for your comment. Uh, yes. yes, we did discuss raising this at governor briefings, and that would be one route to help to promote the fact that when the election process starts, to get the information out via a number of different channels to make sure that anyone who is eligible to put themselves forward as a nominee has the opportunity to know that they have the chance to do that. And thank you for your comment, Sharon, saying that you think that that would be useful and be helpful with the consistency of the induction process. So thank you very much. Does anybody else have any comments they'd like to raise on this paper now? As I say, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot today about being a mentor, but if you think that's something that you would be happy to consider doing, then please could you email Adrian outside the meeting or we'll put that as an action for everybody to, to consider whether they'd be happy to put themselves forward to do that or not. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Th thanks very much. And thanks again to the uh, task and finish group. Uh, really, really great meeting. Thank you. Super. OK, so we'll now move on to the next paper, which is paper C. And this one is going to be presented by Sonia, Sonia Harbin. And it's about approval of the cent central school services block savings that we need to make. So over to you to explain the position we're in again, Sonia, and what the proposal is. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alison. Um, good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Sonia Harbin and I'm the CRP Strategic Lead for Finance. I'd just like to apologise for my hay fever if I start having a sneezing fit, as like lots of others, I'm really struggling this year. Um, as per the paper, 2223 is going to be the third year that we've had to fund 20% savings from services that support schools through the Central School Services Block. Um, and the DSG guidance that we have to follow means that all commitments funded from the historical elements of this block of the grant have to be agreed by forum on a line by line basis. And we will do this as normal at our vote at our October meeting. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the working group who um, responded um, to my suggestions earlier on and helped, therefore, to shape this paper. Um, and what I thought would be a better idea than just coming in October was to actually try and come up and share with Schools Forum the um, some ways that we can already find some of those savings. So this paper is recommending a way that 534,000 of the total 847,000 that we need to find could be met. Uh, it shares with Schools Forum that officers are working on how the remainder of the target could be achieved. And those details are being agreed um, by senior leads, uh, particularly in the education learning and early help teams. The savings proposed in this paper will ensure that there's no change in the services that schools receive through activities funded by the CSSB. Um, and in addition, it is the intention of the Corporate Director for Children's Services, I. Allen, to share with the corporate leadership team and after that the joint leadership team, the impact of losing this vital source of funding will have on the most vulnerable children and young people in order that it's seen, if we can, as a priority demand on core funding resources. Um, and so future reductions could be met corporately rather than from within the directorate um, an impact on schools. Um, however, um, I need to say that given the financial position of the local authority and we're likely to have another one year um, 
uh, financial settlement this year. Um, we need to be prepared. It's maybe unachievable and have to be prepared really for not being able to um, get those resources in or, or not entirely. Um, so uh, that's really a summary of the paper. Um, I'm quite happy now to take any questions that anybody's got. So really what this paper is asking is um, for you to agree um, these savings now so we can just concentrate on finding the remainder um, 330,000 odd, I can't remember the exact total, um, which we have already got some plans for. But as I said, the details of those are just being really worked up. Great, thanks for um, outlining that then, Sonia. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Um, Peter Collins, coming to you, thank you. Hello, um, yeah, I'm Peter. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I'm a newbie here, so I'm a, forgive any naivety on there. Um, the central block always seems a bit opaque, and and actually we don't see much detail about what that what that covers. And and ideally would like that explained. Um, but also looking at the proposal, um, are you not again putting more pressure on the high needs? Um, budget by moving that extra cost into it and then we'll obviously you know we're concerned that the the deficit in there will ultimately impact on our children in SEN so um, that's the two questions really I mean by by accepting this proposal we're, we're putting ourselves under higher pressure um, and you know obviously the central services block is, is a bit opaque we don't know what precisely what's in it so if yeah. yeah, thanks for that, Peter. So the Central School Services Block, um, or the CSSB, um, is one of the four blocks of funding we get via DSG. And it's basically, there are two elements of it. There's the element that used to fund the um, uh, statutory elements, what was called the ESG. Um, and that bit is um, supports things like um, our admissions team, our infrastructure and planning. So there's certain, the, the DSG guidance is very clear on what we can spend that bit on. That bit is secure. It's the other bit of funding, which is for the historically agreed commitments. So these are commitments that Schools Forum have agreed I mean, going back about 10 years, really, um, that we would be supporting through that block of funding um, that ensures that schools get certain um, services, things like it supports our early help team. Um, and all of these um, services, Peter, are explained in detail in our October um, forums where we then vote on those. So what might be useful rather than run through all the sort of detail is we can send you, I'll ask Teresa if she can send you the link to last year's October CSSB paper. Actually, I think it was November, Teresa, that will give you all the details of exactly what those services provide because we have a whole annex and each of those services is described in detail. So I think that will give you that information that you're looking for. Um, you're absolutely right about the high needs block. Um, uh, what we're trying to do here is look at the funding. So DSG, um, obviously, it has to be spent on certain things. And what we're able to do is use the DSG, so the high needs block, block guidance does allow the current um, uh, activity that's being funded from the CSSB to be funded by the high needs block and in the context of the overall materiality it's only a small amount so our overall high needs block I think is about I'm going to say about 75 million I'm thinking that's before the recruitment for academies so we're talking about just moving that final about um, uh, 90,000 I can't remember 100 yeah it's about 90,000 because some of the SEND school support is actually business support which actually we're funding or we're taking that as a hit from core funding in effect um, to support the DSG um, so, yes, it does add a um, pressure on the Heinies block. However, I've been working with Gemma, um, who's our SEND um, head of funding, and that has been taken into account in the DSG deficit recovery plan. 
and we're still um, rather hopeful that we'll get a very good settlement next year. That we'll find out about that next month in July, um, and that what we're hoping for is that there'll be that capacity in the high knees block to cover that funding. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. We'll then have to make decisions on having to reduce um, some of our high knees block um, activities or costs, um, and that can only that will only be a detriment to the services that we provide. But what we're trying to do is protect the services for the the very most vulnerable children Um, in the past um, the early the working group are have been very clear that actually we need to really try and protect where we can particularly our early help teams some of that early intervention work that's really supporting schools Um, but we're mindful that at the end of the day all of this funding is going to go and so it's a case of um of, you know how we plan those reductions and the, uh, that, re- that that reduction in cost, rather than um, it won't happen. We we you know, at the moment obviously we know it is going to happen, but it's just what we cut first really, and where can we identify other sources of funding that can cover that. So I hope that's provided you some information, Peter. As I said, I think the paper will will really help support give you that detail. Um, Okay, thank you, Thanks. Sonia. Thanks for the comprehensive explanation. That's great. No problem. And, and obviously, you know, we're talking about all schools, aren't we? I mean, obviously, Absolutely. that's my area. So it's, you know, everyone is going to feel some pain, aren't they? But I was just, yeah. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. There's, and, and that's what we're trying to do is work, as I said, with the whole of, of, of the forum and all the different sectors to try and cause the least pain um, that we can and, and try and, and find a way to... Um, ensure those services aren't um, put at risk. Okay, thank you. For for those people who haven't been on forum very long, CSSB has been one of those issues that we've been grappling with over the last few years since we had the announcement from DfE that this funding pot was going to disappear. So it isn't that we're choosing to use the money for something else, it's the fact that this funding stream is going and we've only got limited ways that we can uh, fine to in order to cover the costs that were previously covered by CSSB. So um, thank you for that explanation, Sonia. I think that was really helpful. Now, I know Julia wants to ask a new question, but Adrian, you put your hand up. So does Adrian, does your hand up relate to what Sonia's just said or shall I come to you first? It, it does. I wonder, could I just come in quickly? It's just to thank, thank Peter for his question. And just to add, if I may, to Sonia's response, um, Peter, the CSSB is absolutely a really complicated area, but we do as officers work really hard for it not to appear opaque. And not only would I commend to you to have a look at the papers that I know Teresa will send a link to, the November paper. We put, the, oh, excuse me, <coughs> we put to, together very detailed detailed appendices of not only what we've spent, how we've spent it, what would be the impact if we didn't receive those monies. And it's worth, as well as looking at the um, November paper, all of the papers going back over a decade are available on Suffolk Learning. And I'll ask Teresa to send you a link to that because there's some helpful descriptions in the previous October's paper about the history of CSSB um, because in many respects I think sometimes there's a sense that it's a top slice on schools budgets and it really isn't at all um, the, 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 that central school service block particularly the elements that Sonia referred to around admissions and a range of the local authorities duties they were put into that block when the education support grant was removed in 2015-2016 so it's the money that the council got to meet its statutory duties but it did cloud it when it was was put in with um, with other budgets within the DSG and forum are, are, are asked to vote about it. Um, so I'll ask Teresa to send you a link to the to the previous year's October paper. And um, one of the things that actually a colleague and I had spoken about is we're going to we're going to harvest some information from those papers to be part of the induction pack because um, CSSB, although it's going, it's it's not going in an even manner, and it will be an issue for forum to look at. And we think it's one of the key things we need to put some some headline FAQs around. So thanks very much for the question, and hopefully. Hopefully that adds and supports um, uh, Sonia's response and also your, your ability to have a look at further information on it. Thank, thanks, um, Alison. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Julia Upton, if I can come to you for your question now, thank you. 
Hello, morning. It was very similar with regard to the send saving. Um, I have to say I've not allayed all my fears, Sonia, in terms of whether we can meet that through the, the high need block. But equally, you've expressed that they feel that they can cope with that pressure. And then just a question for clarification, the point 14 where the savings for subsequent years, we're assuming that is and those are further savings. So it's not that if we meet the 847,000 that there will be less pain in future years. That pain is going to continue for some time. Exactly. So that so that the pain that we will feel, as you said, is 20 percent of the CSSB, the historical elements every year. That's what they're currently saying. My concern is that in one of those years, they may just say, we're just going to take all of it away. And that's the real difficulty with planning. So you'd, you, we, we've got to plan on this 20 percent. But but you know, we, we might get six months notice that actually next year they're just going to take all of it away. So it's quite difficult to try and come up with a, a redesign or look at how we can restructure services. This is the best we've got. So we've just got to be really aware of that. Um, and as I said, what I'm, I'm really hopeful for is that um, particularly with um, Alan and um, our new um, cabinet members um, sort of um, backing, we can try and get some of that um, shown as a corporate um, risk. Because actually, if we start to reduce our early help service, it's not it, it, you can't just take bits of it. You Then almost the whole thing falls out. So we, we're really keen that, that it's not just the fact that schools will lose out it's the whole of our, of our sort of most vulnerable children and early help um, but it's just it's balancing that with the fact that one we're just going to probably get as I said a one-year settlement so we just don't you know we just don't know how we're going to sort of um, be able to meet that but we'll try our best to get that prioritized that's great thank you yeah thank you um can see another question yeah. Well, that the um, the statutory element, um, uh, Alison, that will continue. So that actually goes up based on um, our pupil numbers. So um, and because Suffolk were quite low on that, um, our actual element of that is increasing. But what that really needs to also cover is things like the statutory element that we use. So let, let, if I just take the admissions team as a good example, obviously each year they, they'll get pay inflation. So any increase in that statutory element would help support the additional costs each year that we get of those teams, the infrastructure team, the planning team, that kind of thing. Um, so there's no indication. That, so the statutory element, might, you know, that, that seems to still be uh, increasing. I don't think that's at risk. Lovely, thank you. Are there any other comments or questions about this paper before we move on? Just give you a moment to indicate. No, super. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, we've got to go to vote now. That's the important bit. Okay, Barbara, over to you, please. If you could now launch the question for us to vote. So it's um, the question's about to come up on your screen. So it's about whether Forum are happy to agree the described savings proposal of 0.534 million. So I'll read out the vote. In response to the 847,000 grant reduction to be imposed by the DfE in 22-23 in relation to services funded by the CSSB, do you agree the described savings proposal of £534,000, which are the result of work of local authority officers and shared with schools forum subgroup. So voting members only, could you either indicate for or against now, please? And remember to hit submit. Okay, thank you. Teresa, we've had 13 votes cast. Does that look accurate number to you as to how many votes you're expecting, please? Alison, um, it looks to be about 16 because we have had apologies. So there might be another couple maybe come through. Um, if not, we can always obviously update that in the minutes. OK, thank you very much. So at the moment, we've had 13 votes for, no votes against and no abstentions. So even if um, there are two or three members present who haven't been able to follow the voting procedure, if you feel your vote might have been missed, then please email Teresa and Teresa will note that in the minutes. But given how many people have voted for, then it wouldn't make a difference to the result of the vote. So I can confirm for the minutes that um, Schools Forum are in agreement with the proposals for the savings for 
thousand pounds as set out in the paper. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that, Barbara and Teresa. So now we can move on to paper D, which is about the DSG deficit recovery plan. So Gemma, hand over to you. Thank you, Gemma Morgan. Thank you, Alison. I think Alan's going to come in as well to do. Yeah, I was just going to say a couple of words of introduction, Alison, if that's OK. Yes, thank you, Alan. Uh, good morning. I'm Alan Caddo, uh, Corporate Director for Children and Young People Service. For those who don't know me, I just wanted to say a bit before, before Gemma gets into the detail um, about this paper um, and about SEND places in Suffolk in general. So over the past six months, we've seen an unprecedented demand uh, for SEND places in Suffolk with weekly referrals from mainstream schools increasing to between 80 and 120 per week. The specialist settings within the local offer are filling up and we find ourselves in a position where we do not have enough places despite all the place, extra places created for all the children are being referred. Um, this increase in demand has made the modelling for the future provision requirements more challenging than ever, meaning that we can expect differences in what we are currently predict to actual activity over the next four years. It's unclear at this time whether this increase in demand is a direct impact of the pandemic. There's no doubt that the pandemic will have been a factor, um, but we don't know whether how much is a pandemic effect and how much uh, is maybe a new normal. We obviously, as a local authority, have a critical role in placing children with sent into specialist provision. However, this, however, this is a whole system challenge. If schools continue to make referrals, and I've no doubt you're making those referrals for the best possible reasons, um, but if you continue, if schools continue to make referrals as they, they do, then the whole system will need to be reviewed in order to reach a more manageable position. This is a collective challenge to the system, and we need to be clear that it's one we need to address together. Um, it's also worth noting that the DSG guidance states very uncategorically that we are not allowed to use core funding to fund SEND and therefore are unable to get additional funding from other areas of the local authority. So unlike with as with early help or, or other parts that are funded from CSSB, there is a you know a slim possibility that we might be able to get some of that funding from the base for base budget in the county council. We cannot do that lawfully with uh, with this block with this, this funding. Um, the date, just lastly to say, the data we used for previous predictions was accurate. However, since the October schools form, the rise in demand has been, as I said, unexpected and actually unprecedented. The figures used within the current paper that Gemma is presenting are modelled on a middle ground between the worst and best case scenarios. So I just thought that might be helpful as a way of introduction to set the context and where we are at the moment. Thank, Thank you, Alan. That's really helpful context. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gemma Morgan, the Head of SEND Funding and Provider Services. Um, so I, I've written a brief paper and there's two, there were there were two um, points to my paper. One was to share with you the DST Deficit Recovery Plan and the other was to inform you of um, a predicted overspend in future years. So to, to address the first point, so what I was hoping to attach to the papers when Theresa sent them out was the, was a, an updated version of the DSG recovery plan. At the moment, the version that was sent out in October, November is the one that stands and we are updating it um, to reflect any changes. None of the narrative of cha has changed, but we want to just make sure all of the figures are accurate. The recovery of the deficit at the moment will continue as it did in the paper that went out in um, in the autumn, um, but we just want to um, tweak it and make sure we're using the, the ESFA's latest template. Now, in doing that, it's meant that we don't actually, that template is is riddled with cell errors, and Mike Quinton is, is busily working in the background to get us a polished version of that paper um, to um, send round. So that will go come with the minutes. So I apologise that I haven't got one to show you at, at the meeting, and I do apologise for that. But we will have one to go around with the minutes. And if there's any questions about that following it being issued, then please let me know either via Theresa or directly to myself to send me some questions and I'll be able to to answer them. Um, I think Mike's just put in the um, ESFA have sent version 36 of the plan so we can get that updated and share with the forum. So we've got, as you can imagine, after 36 versions, we are doing our utmost to um, 
to get this right and accurate. Um, so as it stands, the one that we shared previously is, is the current version, but we will get one to you with the minutes. So if that's OK, I'll move on to the next part of the paper. So whilst working on the, the, the DSG recovery plan and also taking into consideration everything that Alan has talked about this morning, the unprecedented demand, um, the pressure we're seeing through our, our, our admissions panels, um, we have looked at what we think the what we can predict for the future years. And that has meant that we are looking at a potential £3.1 million overspend for the current financial year. Now, what I wanted to do this morning was just bring that to your attention, because as, so as Sonia mentioned, we are optimistic that we will get a settlement in July from the ESFA, which will cover that and more. But obviously, we don't know that at the moment. So what I wanted to do was tell you now of the situation, make you aware of our predictions for the next three years um, so that if I if we don't get the settlement we expect in July, I can then come back to you in October with a plan for what we do next. And that will include those things that we've discussed before, which is either asking for more money um, or looking at reducing the um, the top up band values. So as you know, we've already got 0.5% um, from the schools block. We don't want to ask for more, but that would be one of the options that we would explore. But we'd also look at um, reducing the values of the high needs top up bands, which would affect obviously um, every child that has a high needs band. I'm not proposing to do that yet. And this paper's come to you for information, but I just wanted to make you aware of the situation and the fact that if de I've tried to predict demand at a middle position, as Alan explained, because if I predicted it at worst case scenario, um, we don't know if that is a reflection of just a, a growth for this year or whether it's um, a result of the pandemic. Um, so I'm, we've tried our best to predict based on the um, modelling we have in the past year on year um, and also some inflation based on, on the increase in demand. So I hope that explains the position and explains why I've brought this to you for information. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Are there any questions or comments anybody would like to make about the paper, please? Oh, sorry. Sharon. Hello, Sharon. Sharon. I was trying to put my hand up, but all I did was turn my camera on and turn mute on. Um, it's not really a question, Gemma, and it's an impossible thought because it's just this dub double hit. And it, added into this is my concern about how we are meeting the needs of, of send children in our schools. So the allocation from our budget of 4.5 percent and then less um, in the potential, not definite, less in it coming in via the higher needs funding. Uh, there is no answer. I, I know the position that you're in. I'm just going to say that I have concerns and you've got concerns. Everybody's got concerns. But I just think it, it, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I am worried for our children. I'm worried for the children of Suffolk, particularly our SEND children what capacity we can do and then it it comes back to schools because schools have to try and give the best that they can give with the resources that they've got but I'm I, there is no answer but I just I just wanted to share my concerns I'm going to stop now. Thank you Sharon and you're absolutely right there are concerns that we all share um, and we do continue to lobby central government on the fact that we are an underfunded um, local authority um, and we have um, recently completed a, um, th there was a consultation out on how, how funding for high needs would be calculated moving forward. So Sonia, Michael and myself have contributed to that and made it quite clear that, you know, we, that we, as an underfunded um, local authority, we need to use recent data in order to set our budgets moving forward. Thank you. I can see other people in the chat are, are agreeing. We all agree. And we've had a lot of conversations about this at the High Needs Working Group as well, Gemma, haven't we? Um, um, we are, it, it's just um, you can't quite understand why they would want to set our budgets on old pupil number data. That 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 at its very essence doesn't make sense beside the fact that we are so underfunded compared to comparable authorities. It, it would just be a double whammy on us, wouldn't it? Uh, mm, and it, it just it 
so ho hopefully having had feedback through the consultation that, that at least they would use up-to-date data on pupil numbers in in setting our our funding and that you would hope that they would at least close the gap uh, with other neighboring authorities but we've been having this conversation for a lot of years now and that that, that just stokes all of our anxiety i know um, yes, as Sonia puts it, if Suffolk were funded at the average per head in the high needs block, we would not be in this deficit position. So that's an important message to reiterate to anybody who's new around the table, because the rest of us have been aware of that for a long time. But um, that that is the depressing thing. We we actually are very are a very efficient uh, local authority in terms of how we use what funding we've got but it doesn't compensate for the fact that we don't have enough funding to meet all of the need that we have. That, that's, the, that's the issue. Um, Councillor Hood, I can see you have your hand up. Could I turn to you now? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. This is my first um, meeting here as an observer. And I just wanted to add that one of the things that has certainly struck me since taking up my role is this, the fact that we are so underfunded in certain areas and in particular in the SEND area. And um, I'm very clear that, um, you know, people such as Gemma and um, Alan and um, the, the team at Suffolk County Council are doing a tremendous job uh, helping along with everything you're all doing. But I see part of my role as trying to alleviate this uh, this um, lack of funding per pupil head. And um, I, I can't promise that uh, I'll be able to solve anything, but I will certainly be trying because it's a, a recurring theme and I appreciate everybody's concerns. So thank you for, just for letting me um, mention that here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hood. So yes, it's been an anomaly for a long time. And several years ago, when we knew that all the, the, the new national funding formulas were being considered, and we, we saw that as perhaps a, an opportunity that D, the DfE would take to, to make sure there was a level playing field, but um, we still seem to be a long way from that, unfortunately. So um, any lobbying that you can do, Councillor Hood, would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to comment or raise a question at the moment? on this paper before we move on to paper E. We've still got a chance then. So Gemma, shall we jump on to the other information paper, paper E, the infographic, thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, so it's kind of off the back of everything that, that I've just mentioned. We It was discussed at um, our directorate management team that actually we should produce an infographic that demonstrates all of the, the, the work that's going on in the background, demonstrates all of the places we're creating all of the um, set it, the placements we're making in settings, and just to show the the, the rise in the trajectory and, and and how it looks in comparison to some of the other local authorities, um, and how the funding has increased. So the the infographic that was circulated with the agenda, um, which is part of um, the the pa uh, paper, I think we're on paper e. e, aren't we? So yeah, the second page of paper E is the infographic. Again, I've just brought that for information, really, because I wanted at this stage for people to let me know whether they think it's uh, it contains the right information. If people would like to see other information, um, whether it's there's too much on there. Um, I will just point out that there is one error on the graphic that I'll need to change, and that is under the the top up figures graph. Um, the, the, the first section where it says mainstream school, that should be um, maintained mainstream schools. That is not all our mainstream schools because obviously we've got academies and free schools further along in the graph. So I just need to get that tweaked. Um, but then then it should hopefully represent everything. So really, Alison, it was just an opportunity for people to comment on the, in, on the infographic and, and see what they thought of it, really. Thanks, Gemma. Does anybody have any comments, any, any thoughts on how useful this would be or...? where you might want to share it or any other information. Alison, you say you've tried lobbying your MP to limited effect. And yes, we were aware that Mary was meeting some MPs. Has this gone any further? Do we know whether before uh, Mary stopped being the cabinet lead, whether she did have a conversation with the local MPs? I don't know if you know Gemma or if, or if Adrian knows. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that um, Mary did a briefing. I think there were several councillors at the time, and, and I actually think Gordon Jones, although he, he was in a different role, Gordon and Mary met with a number of um, local MPs. I don't think it was all of the MPs. I think their hope had been that it would have been all the Suffolk MPs, and I think it was three of them, but... Uh, um, don't that I, I I might not be um, 100% correct on that, but I know Mary did meet with a number of the MPs, and indeed some of the information I referred to um, earlier around um, the the information that forum members had provided was also used as part of that briefing. Hopefully Thanks, that's Andrew. helpful. And coming back to the infographic, uh, thank you, Sharon. You say that it will be a useful tool to share and to give the full picture of Send in Suffolk. And uh, Julia has said it's a helpful infographic. On the bands table, are these pupil numbers? Might be helpful to have pupil numbers and the monies received for each band to give a year-on-year -year comparison. I don't know if you've got room for that, Gemma. Yeah, I'll have. I can have a look at that. Absolutely, I'll I'll take that away and see whether we can um, see how we can merge some of that information. Um, potentially pull okay. those two into one table, maybe. So we can look at that. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. And of course, if anybody else has any thoughts after the meeting, I'm sure Jen would be happy to, to receive an email with, with any thoughts you've got about um, information that's included on the infographic. OK, there's no further comments on that. We'll move on from that paper. Thank you very much, Gemma. I, I know you're doing your best in difficult circumstances. <laughs> the goalposts keep shifting. I know we had a conversation about all the all the detailed modelling that you and your team had done. And then, as, as yourself and Alan have said, the unprecedented number of extra referrals that have been coming through in the last few months just completely threw all those um, predictions out, out of the window. So it, it's, it's a very difficult landscape at the moment. And I know there's an awful lot more that you and the team would like to do for sending people if only we had the resources to do it so um we could probably keep juggling as best we can and all of you in schools i know how hard you're all working to to do the best you can for all the same pupils and that is really appreciated so we've, we've all just got to keep our fingers crossed for whatever the announcement is in july so um yes let's thank let's, you let's, alison let's hope. okay thanks Gemma. thank you bye bye OK, so coming back to today's agenda, we've gone through all of today's papers. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the forward agenda. I haven't noted anything that's come up during the meeting today, but is there anything anybody would like to request as a particular topic? Sonia, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to say that what we will have on there is um, a paper that will show the DSG um, outturn for 2021. Um, we, I would have, I could have done it for this forum, but um, we're just waiting to find what the recruitment figures will be for um, early years, and I just think it will give more of a sense of um, the, the real position if we've got that. So, and it normally comes in October anyway. So, um, I'll be, I'll be providing that in October, and we'll also have have the um, CSSB vote um, will come in October. Um, I can't think, Mike, is there anything else that you think of on top of your head that will come up? And also we'll then have, a, I can see Je with Gemma's name just come up, we'd obviously again just bring the DSG deficit recovery plan, the update of that as well. Um, those are things that I can think of off the top of my head. Thanks, Sonia. Um, one more thing, sorry, Alison and Sonia, just um, a paper on growth possibly um so we've got about 1.7 million to fund our growth at the moment but we may need some more funding so that's the decision for schools forum to to have a look at so yeah one more paper okay thanks mike Gemma. so yeah just to reiterate what sonia said that we'll we'd bring a paper the dsu deficit recovery plan template and obviously we will know by the next meeting about the um the, the settlement so it will either be a paper um depending on which way the settlement goes it will either be a paper explaining how we will manage the the funding that we've received or how we need to change things to to manage the the future overspend okay thank you very much and um, thank you I, I can see you've noted in the um, comments box that yes the um, infographic can be made to all schools um, and Alan's got some extra thoughts that he'll have with you outside the meeting so um there might be a few more tweaks. And yes, indeed, fingers crossed for the settlement. We've all got our fingers crossed. Yes, uh, let's 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 all hope finally that we might be 
that all, all our lobbying might have got somewhere eventually. I'm too scared to think that we actually will, but um, I, I, we've got to remain optimistic that sometimes things have got to come right, you would hope. Okay, so that was the forward agenda. Uh, the dates of our next meetings are the 7th of October and the 30th of November. So if you can all make sure you've got those in your diaries. Um, I'd just like to have noted um, in the uh, minutes our thanks to our members who will be leaving us. So um, Angela Berry and Louise Spall, if we can note our thanks to them for their contributions to Forum. And most recently, Angela hadn't been on Forum long, but she made a very valuable contribution to the recent task group. So. Um, Anyone who comes on forum and, and gives up their time to read all the papers, digest the way we have to process and think about all the finance implications of the topics that we have and contribute to forum meetings. That's always um, much appreciated. Um, Adrian, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Just a, a very quick addition there. I believe this would be Karen Mills' last forum meeting as well, and we should extend um, the same to Karen. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Apologies that I didn't do that. So, yes, indeed. Thank you, Karen, for all your contributions too. And uh, Louise is now waiting in the lobby, so she might have not have heard the thanks, but she'll read it in the minutes instead. Um, I Will the future meetings be virtual? That will depend on um, how the easing of lockdown goes. Um, our meetings have worked very well virtually so far, I, th I think. Um, but uh, any feedback anybody wants to give on whether um, they have a preference for virtual or meeting in person, we do have to be bear in mind that these are public meetings. We've got around it um, while we have been virtual by running them as live streams on YouTube. Um, so, uh, any, any feedback you wish to give, um, we'll, we'll take that into account when we're making future decisions about whether to meet in person or continue virtually. Thank you. And I see one or two people are putting in the comments that virtual works for them. So, um, Adrian, we might need to do a little bit of um, uh, feedback gathering on that topic as well. Uh, you've got your hand certainly, up. Adrian. Certainly, we can pick that up. Sorry, it's a legacy hand, Alison. I'll take that down. No problem. OK, so... We've come to the conclusion of the meeting today. I can give you all um, a lovely amount of time back uh, this morning as um, you had your whole meetings cleared for this meeting. Uh, yes, virtual is much greener and I agree. Um, I, I actually have got so used to virtual meetings now, it actually seems quite odd to even think about going back in the same room as other people. Um, it, it, it eliminates all the travel time and it's greener. So um, if people are happy to continue virtually, then um, I, I think a lot of us would, would support that view. So we'll, we'll take a collective view. It just can't be on the first people who put comments in the comment box, but uh, we'll... We'll review that as we go along. So thank you very much for your time today and I will now close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.